He says music is the narrative of our lives. From Spotify, please welcome Tim Gans. Hi, everyone. Give everybody a chance to settle after the last uh, presentation. Um, well, thank you very much. It's exciting to be here today. Um, I was really moved by the opening comments from Shara from Forrester talking about how we now live in a post-digital world. And we most certainly do. And uh, for, for those of us that are in the music intelligence space studying music content and music culture, it's a really exciting time. So back 85 years ago, they used to measure music and its popularity and success based on the sheet music that they would sell. How many copies that they would make would basically kind of denote whether an artist or a song were successful. So that was then. Uh, through about eight or nine significant and drastic format changes, uh, we now are in a more digital age where we're looking at things in a much different way. And I wanted to just share some of the techniques that we use at the Echonest, part of Spotify, to um, understand music a little bit better. So we now have feature extraction software that allows us to look and take a couple seconds, sometimes less than a second, at each audio file and extract every music event in the song. Basically, the things you'd see on those same sheets that people would buy and, and measure the popularity of a song for. So the pitch, key, tempo, time signature, all expressed in code that you can easily incorporate into other parts of your analysis. Over time, we started to see that this, this information that was every music event in the song was highly granular. It was very, very detailed, almost too detailed. So we came up with the four summary measures that you see at the bottom there, energy, which is self-explanatory, the valence of a song, which is the positivity of the beat, danceability, again, fairly obvious, and the runability. So there's nothing more stupid than me sitting up here describing music when we have all of these. We live in a post-digital age, right? So I don't know how this thing works, though. So. Um, I thought I would just show you. So just to give you a quick primer before we go on with the rest of the presentation, give you an idea of what we mean when we talk about energy of a song and the danceability of a song. So um, we're going to use the musical stylings of recent Nobel Prize in Literature winner Bob Dylan. Uh, on the y-axis, you're going to have how danceable the track is. And on the x axis did I do that wrong? On the x-axis is the energy. So we're going to start in this bottom left-hand quadrant. This is low energy, low danceability. For you. So that makes sense. That's really easy. There's a lot of Dylan tunes like that, right? Low energy, low danceability. It's kind of what we come to know, come to know from Bob Dylan. Um, this is low energy, high danceability. This is a little bit trickier with Bob Dylan. is a real mellow quality to it, but it's a very danceable song, which is not easy to find in Bob Dylan's canon. Okay, so next one is high energy and high danceability. Broken nights, broken days. And finally, high energy, low danceability. Alright, we got it? It's pretty easy, right? So now, uh, for runability, it's just as easy. I'm going to use uh, future Nobel Prize winning winner in literature, Calvin Harris, to describe. I feel so close to you right now. OK, so that's one track. Yeesh. OK, 
Okay, so one of those two tracks is more runnable, and hopefully I won't insult you by having to tell you which one. So that second one has much more rhythmic stability. It's a lot easier to run to. So this is the kind of work that we did. We were focused on music culture and music content. We were really deadly focused on understanding more of it based on the privileges afforded by the digital realm that never were possible before. So we really wanted to understand this content. And two and a half years ago, we became part of Spotify, then we got access to the largest music behavior repository that's ever existed. So now, not only just understanding music culture, music content, we can start understanding music behavior. So we can start to see what 100 million plus users creating 2 billion plus uh, playlists, representing over 25 billion streaming hours, are actually doing with this. We can understand when they're listening, why they're listening, with the different reasons that they might be invoking a certain song over another. And the first thing we wanted to look at was the genre taxonomy. It's something that we've done a lot of work in in the past. And one thing that we were kind of surprised by was that genres aren't very meaningful anymore to today's listener. Uh, in fact, of the top 100 playlists on Spotify, 41 are represented by some sort of context or meaning, some sort of way that the music actually is associative or complementary to a, a certain thing that somebody does during the day versus only 17 for what we've come to know as, as genre, that more rational taxonomy around music. So we needed to understand this. We figured it'd be a pretty critical thing. And they're the kind of things that you'd understand. It's basically the kind of things that we all do because we're talking about a mobile first product and we're talking about a medium, an art form that really can accompany and improve pretty much anything that you're doing at any point in the day, including sleeping. So we thought to understand these contexts would be to understand some new ways to, to understand how people are actually consuming music. So we did some simple approaches. The first approach was very simple. We took the, the playlists. We queried against them. We aggregated the tracks. In this case, we're looking for songs that are distinctive but mainstream to running for an older male demographic. So we, we, we query it, we aggregate the tracks, and then we're left with the list. And that list isn't very surprising. That's kind of what, you know, I think we'd all kind of imagine this. <laughs> But we found something actually a lot more interesting when we started playing around and looking deeper into it and removing any layers around the mainstreamness of it and just looking at things that were hyper distinctive to a particular activity, not just running. For running, this is a great example of it. These are tracks that uh, up to a point had been completely dormant within Spotify. Nobody was using them at all, but they were used very often for these kind of things. I wanna be and that makes sense too. It's not something you think about it, but this is a great song to run to. And just to give equal time. A younger demographic, female. And it works across a variety of different contexts. So this is stuff that you listen to while you're driving. This is this first panel. Um, this is the morning commute for that same demographic. This is a road trip. Very, very different. And this is an evening playlist. Evening commute. And consistently more hopeful. The energy level is a little bit between a road trip and a morning commute, but you can tell there's a quality that people are seeking. Fitness is a great area for these kind of this kind of context because it's very varied. So you can hear the variation of each one of these different things in the music itself. So we look at running, just that rhythmic stability, yoga. It just keeps going on like that. <laughs> CrossFit. Snowboarding, skiing. Oh, good tops on the root girls, hanging in the mini skirts and knee high socks. Get on your granddad's jumper, is Gino. Woof. 
uh, spin class. And hi. So I don't have a lot of time left, so I know you were embarrassed to ask, and I'm just going to answer before you even have to. <laughs> and... Turn the water yeah. Shade yeah. off So this was a tricky one, but one thing I found last time I was doing some, some querying around this is actually those two, the, the 18 to 24 year old women and the over 55 year old men actually have a sexy time song in common. It's this one. Because disco has kind of made a mini resurgence and the older guy lived through it. So, so the last slide I'll leave you with is to, the, to um, understand that uh, music doesn't just represent activities and context of somebody's personal life, it also can reflect the culture. So um, we'll end with a quick quiz. So this represents a, a daily streaming chart for Janet Jackson for this song. Okay, so in March of 15, sorry, in March of 15, uh, this song celebrated its 15 year anniversary at number one. In June, they announced a tour for Rhythm Nation 1814, the, the album that it was on, kind of a seminal album in 1990. And then in March, they canceled the tour, and there was a lots of news about all the different reasons as to why this tour might have been canceled. So there was a lot of different activity around this. And then since the March of 16, it's been pretty static. Then we can take another song from the same album. Oh, so sorry. All right. Oh. Just enjoyed a big bump in October, and there was a very big difference, and I think we all know why. So, thank you, everyone. Joining Tim, he's created iconic advertising. From Hill Holiday, here's Lance Jensen. All right. Thanks yeah. for coming, man. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for being here, everybody. So, I have just a few simple questions. All right. Um, how do you think Spotify in the sort of larger digital ecosystem that we're all existing in right now, how do you think that has changed the way new artists, different artists are sort of coming up in the world and making a name for themselves and getting an audience? Well, I think, uh, you know, there's, it's kind of a, there's, a, there's two sides to the coin. So uh, it's easier than ever now to get published and distributed on large platforms with huge audiences, um, but it's easy for everyone. So it's harder to get heard, even though it's easy to kind of have the access to a stage. So I think uh, that's when you need to use the advantages afforded by the digital realm and be able to use information that you can get about what's, what's being played, where it's being played, where you're being listened to, what associations are made with your music with other artists that are similar, and leverage that and be able to be basically your own brand, to be authentic and approach uh, those fans in a meaningful way because you now have access to them like you never did before. Do you have any examples of any artists that you think of really like doing it right in the digital age as far as like making a name for themselves and really taking it full advantage of it? Uh, I think, uh, I think, I think they all do such a great job. They're like children and I wouldn't want to single one out. Um, you can like but, one the most. But there's a, there's actually, we all do. There's a, there's a, there's an artist in Sweden named Tovlo who was, um, much like what we were just talking about, a fairly dormant artist that got put on a specific playlist that actually kind of propelled her into a, a pretty big stratosphere, like for, from where she started. And um, she quickly started understanding that user base and working with collaborative artists that are very similar to be able to kind of, to kind of emphasize and kind of 
take advantage of the fact that she was she had this audience for a short period of time, and now she's you know a pretty big mainstream act. So yeah, there's plenty of examples on Spotify. Very cool. Now, how how would you suggest brands and modern marketers and all the people out there who are faced with all these sort of decisions about you know they have a certain finite of amount of money and uh, you know they're trying to maximize it and get the most out of it how, how can brands best take advantage of the the data and the analytics and the insight that uh, Spotify has but well, I think that's just it the the um, you know earlier one of the panelists was talking about um, how advertising needs to be more of an experience um, more uh, kind of ubiquitous rather than a, a, a click-through and I think that when you've got the music repository that we just talked about, something that's um, basically got information that was never, ever available to anyone ever before. So back even, you know, five, six years ago, you understood when something was a hit. People downloaded it a lot or, you know, prior to that, they bought a lot of plastic, they bought a lot of CDs, and you knew that was a hit that, was, that people had, had, had shown because they had purchased it. What, what we didn't understand, what the artist didn't understand, is that of those people that bought it, there are some that have a very deep relationship with it that listen to it multiple times a day. They might listen to it multiple times a day for six months. It's the kind of thing that you never understood before. So now you can start understanding the intensity of your fans and the passion that, that they have for whether it be particular tracks or particular albums, but actually just how incorporated into your day-to-day -day life the artist actually is. When something came out and you just bought, bought something once, you never had those kind of insights. But you know, being a technology company and kind of starting ground up as a technology company, um, we've built an architecture that allows us to get at this information really easily. So I think the world of music is highly applicable pretty much to all forms of advertising. And I think you can apply that data you know, across many different tactical things like tour sponsorships and understanding sync better, uh, understanding what your audience is listening to, but also the more just ethereal things like what they're doing and what relationships your, your users have. I think there's a, a lot of value there. Yeah, cool. So the last question is, I, I believe that, you know, everything has two sides and, you know, we're talking a lot about the sort of positive aspects of, of this technology and how it can enrich your musical listening experience, uh, you know, through various algorithms, et cetera. What, um, do you see any negative repercussions of this digitized world and the fact that um, Spotify can know so much about the, the listeners and in general basically curating a reality for them all the time? Like, is there room for randomness or are we all just going to be programmed? Yeah, I think the hardest thing about, I think maybe any media recommendation, but m certainly music recommendation has always been how subjective and personal it is as an art form. Like, there's a reason why uh, you'll like a certain track that might be different than, than, than the reason I do. And that kind of serendipity um, you know, there's probably certain songs that you like a lot that probably have nothing to do with the way they sound. They probably evoke a certain memory, um, an experience that you had. Um, and that kind of serendipity around music and how it touches our lives can never be engineered. Um, in, in those cases, Spotify is just a platform to deliver music to you. What we want to make sure we do is understand music well enough much better than our users so that we can deliver music to them at the right time when they do when they do want it. But I wholeheartedly agree, I think, with the sentiment of your question that um, music is a highly subjective art form and um, there's a lot of, um, there's not a lot of answers as to why people love things. And sometimes uh, it's good that those things don't have answers. Very cool. What about the future of Spotify? Like, what do you think... Um, what do you think it's going to be, let's say, five years from now? Uh, well, hopefully there'll be you know multiple billion users, um, and the kind of potential that we've seen thus far is kind of fully realized around truly personalizing and making music a lot more enriching for each one of those billions of users at that time, and in what form in five years and what form that delivery is. 
is, is anyone's guess. But I would imagine it's not just going to be, you know, tapping it into a black mirror. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, I think Spotify sees itself as a, a leader in that art form and really wants to take that art form in new directions. And I think five years is a long way, but I think, I think there's a lot of exciting things that could happen. Now, the algorithms that help make these associations, right now they're for music. Could they ever be used for other associations that people have? Well, I, you know, you can use music as a proxy. Somebody's tasting music as a proxy to other things. Um, it's a pretty good indicator on political affiliation. It's also a pretty good, if, you know, there are, you know, there are some pretty good proxies around music for other forms of media and entertainment that you could use. But our focus, where I specifically sit, the lens I look through, uh, treats music as its own specific art form because it's, like I said before, like so highly subjective and personal that um, I think any associations you make beyond it, you do so kind of at your own peril. I mean, it's, it's, you know, any marketer will tell you more data the better, and we can give you really strong signal around music, but in terms of the, the focus that we have around serving music at the right moment to the right person, um, I think it's in its own silo. I think it's unique. Now, what does Spotify do to help give people what they want musically, but help them always kind of press that, press those boundaries and give them something surprising? Well, so when you look at a user on Spotify, you have a profile that we look at many different things. And we don't just look at what music you like. We'll look at the different variations of it. So we can kind of measure uh, you know, the passion you have for an artist, how mainstream your taste is. And one of those very big metrics is how adventurous you are. So if we see a user that's actually explored lots of different genres and is really curious about looking around for new, different sounds, then we're going to be more apt to serve that kind of music, you know, different kinds of music that we think has been proven to be enjoyed by other users that could be enjoyed by more adventurous users. But it really depends on, it's truly personalized. It really depends on like, how you're going to be using the platform. So it all comes down to the user in the end. Always, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Lance.